God's grace and his mercy are yours, given to you through the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let's just have a quick show of hands. Have you guys ever seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movie or the series? Quick show of hands if you've seen that. Yeah, if you've seen that, then you know something about Captain Jack Sparrow's compass. Do you remember his compass? It's not like ordinary compasses, or compi, maybe you would say. It's not like ordinary compasses. Do you remember what it, it points to? Exactly. Whatever you want most in life, it will point to, right? It doesn't point true north. It's always pointing to the one thing, treasure, a woman, whatever. Whatever he wants the most is what he is going to follow, and that, you know, leads his heart. You know, how, how perfect, you know, if, if they could have that technology today, I think that in our day and age, in this age of me and my attitudes and what I want, this would be a million-dollar seller. Because we live in a world where we follow our desires, where we easily follow what we want. It is the culture these days that you're not going to tell me what truth is. I will find my own truth. And when I find my own truth, you don't get to tell me what real truth is. I'm going to do what I want, and if it's not harmful to you, then you have no business telling me what to do. And so this world of, of this age of me, boy, that, that Jack Sparrow compass, million-dollar idea. If you, can, if you can invent it, you know, give me a dividend of your share because you're going to be a rich person because that's the world we live in. See, the great thing about real compasses, not the Jack Sparrow compass, but the ones that you would get at Fleet Farm, is that a compass will always point true north, right? That's its job, to find the magnetic and find true north so you always know which way you are going. And it is useful, whether you're walking down the road or in a field or in a forest, a compass will tell you that if you're getting off track here, if you wanted to go north and you happen to be going a little north east, well, we can simply correct that, and we can get you back on track. But in our society, you know, that maybe is needed more than ever, because we know people, maybe it's you, but we know people in our lives that seem to be following that Jack Sparrow compass more than the real compass. They seem to be going down a path that is not good for them. Now, this person in your life, it might be a co-worker. It might be a friend of yours. This person in your life going down a bad path may be one of your children. This person going down a, a bad path in your life might be a loved one, a sister, a brother, a, a confidant, a, a, fr a Facebook friend. And they're going down a path that you know is going to be destructive for them. They're not listening to you anymore. They're not even seeking your advice anymore. And you just sit back and you realize you're, you're destructing yourself. You're going down following what you want, but you're off here, and bad things are going to happen. Maybe it's you. Maybe if you're honest with yourself, you're realizing that if you were to pull out a compass, that compass is going to look more like Jack Sparrow's compass, following your desires, your wants, your needs, your attitudes, instead of God's attitudes. And so, if you are that friend, then this message today is for you. If you know somebody in your life going down a path that is bad, this message is for you. And like we said last week, when we were talking about maybe you have a friend that is talking about and thinking about suicide, maybe it's not in your world yet, but this is the day that you're going to want to take notes because you will know someone in your life, or maybe you will, if you're honest with yourself, going down a bad path, making decisions that are going to be harmful for them, harmful to their body, harmful to their relationships, harmful to their soul. So what do you do? What do you say? What do you say if that cousin of yours keeps making financial decisions that you know they're going to go broke? What do you say to that person in your life that is now dabbling in the chemicals and don't seem to have any care to get out of it? What do you say to that person in your life that seems to be not showing up to work as much anymore, taking their job flippantly, and you just know bad things are going to happen? They're not listening to you anymore. They're not talking. How do you handle that? 
That's what we're going to be talking about today. I want to take you to the book of Luke, uh, one of uh, Jesus' biography, Matthew, Mark, Luke, where Jesus is talking to us and giving us one of his most famous parables he has ever given. And it's what we call the prodigal son parable. Now, a parable, let's just, uh, let's just define some terms here. A parable was one of Jesus' favorite ways to teach. And what he would do is he would take an everyday story, an everyday situation that we all can understand, and he would teach us and take that story to teach us about God. These parables are always about God. God is the central figure in all of Jesus' story, which we're going to uh, need to realize and remember as we're learning this. The second thing is it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. We always call it uh, the prodigal son, but nowhere in this parable is the word prodigal in there. In fact, if you look up the word prodigal, the word prodigal, a lot of people think was invented because of this. So prodigal means someone that squanders something. Well, they probably got it from this account, meaning that this is an account of somebody that made a lot of decisions that you and I have made made a lot of decisions that you and I will make, made a lot of decisions that that friend of ours continues to make. And take a look at what the Father, take a look at what God does in this situation. That's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to go through it, and then I've got six, actually with a bonus, seven things that we can keep in our minds as we are dealing with that person in our life who is going down a bad path, and we know it. And they don't seem to know, or they don't seem to care about where it's leading them. So uh, feel free to follow along. It's written for you in your worship folder on one side, and then you can take notes on the other. Um, And we're going to go to what we call the uh, the prodigal son parable. And Jesus starts out this way. He says, Jesus continued, Now, there was a man who had two sons. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to take a look at the younger son. There are two sons. When we have more time or in a different situation, we'll talk about the full parable. We're just going to focus on the younger son today. And the younger son says something unreal. It, it, it seems even unreal in today's standards. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. I mean, we, we think of Jesus' time being so much different than ours. Not, not in some things. I mean, back then... The father, the parents, treated their estate, their money, the same way that they treat, we treat ours, and that is when one of us passes away, when both of us pass away, everything we have now is yours for you kids to, to divide up. Well, here we have a situation where the younger one is greedy. The younger one comes up and demands, doesn't ask, demands, and says, Father, give me my share of the estate right now. You're still living, but I want mine right, I want my half right now. And so he divided his property between them. Again, this is not the norm. Uh, For my kids, if they ever came up to me and said, hey, Dad, happy 50th, I'd like my share now, I'm probably going to say, you know what, I'm going to enjoy my my wealth a little bit longer. You'll get yours later, but uh, no, I love you, but thanks. It's not going to happen. And I doubt it would happen for you either. So with that, that part, it seems very unreal to us. Here's the part that seems very real. Here's the part that we can uh, hang on to quite easily. Well, that younger one, after he got his half of the estate, it wasn't long after that, Jesus says in this parable, the younger son got together all he had, sent off for a foreign country where he squandered his wealth um, in wild living. Um, That part we, we know pretty well. It's easy to make bad decisions, isn't it? It's easy to make bad decisions when we have money. It's easy to make bad decisions when we have power. It's easy for us to make bad decisions. It, heck, you're going to make bad decisions this week. You made bad decisions last week. You're going to do great in making bad decisions. I, could, I, I know what this guy's going through. 14. Well, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So obviously he was thinking, I'll spend now. I'll make money, uh, maybe growing things. I'll, you know, I'll just uh, have fun now, and then I'll get back to seriousness. Well, there's a severe famine, and he doesn't have a chance for new income. He spent it all, and there's no new water coming in to replace the old. And so, what did he do? Well, he felt he was limited in choices. He went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country 
who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. To an Israelite who would have been told by God, if you love me, God would say, I don't want you to be around pigs. Not that I don't like bacon, not that I don't, you know, ham doesn't taste good. It was one way of God saying, if you want to worship me, stay away from some things. And in this case, if you want to worship me, stay away from pigs. And so this would have been a huge insult to the man. This would have been a huge um, humiliating thing to, in a way, sell his own religion away, to get rid of and, and to, to forego his religion because he needs money. I've got to do something. And so I will go and I will hang around pigs that I've been told are dirty and filthy and second-class animals because I need cash. I'm starving. And so, at 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods, the, the, the throwaways that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So with that, you know, we, we, can, we can understand what he's going through here, too. You know, we know the consequences of making bad decisions. We know what it's like when we make bad decisions and we get off of our moral compass, when we start going down bad paths. Here comes depression. Here comes regret. Here comes shame. Here comes real-life consequences. I can't pay for this because I've got to pay this ticket. We have this guy right here. This is us. Well, Jesus continues, verse 17. Well, when he came to his senses, what am I doing, he says, you know, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so he got up and he went to his father. I'm going to go. I've come to my senses. Not only have I sinned against my father, but I've sinned against God. I have gone and I've demanded what shouldn't have been mine. I've gone and I've squandered the blessings God has given to me. I have gone and I have basically gone down this terrible path and I, have no, I had no shame about it. And now I've woken up. I've realized I've done wrong. I'm going to go back and I'm going to confess. I know the relationship with my father is going to be different. I know there's not going to be any forgiveness and there's going to be consequences. Because that's what I would do, right? This guy is thinking, that's what I would do. If you came back and we did this, that's exactly how I would treat you. I would treat you and I would punish you. I would give you consequences. I'd make you feel terrible. I'd make you feel shame. That's what I would do. That's what's going to happen. But I'm starving to death. I'm going to go back and I'm going to try to get a job working for my father. Well, meanwhile, take a look at what the father is doing. Remember, again, and we'll get into this in a little bit, the father here is God, right? This is a story about how God loves us. Look at what the father is doing while his son is off, while his son is starving, while his son is coming to his senses. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. This whole time, the father had been looking for him and waiting for him and patiently wanting him to come back. And he was filled with compassion for his son. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. Talk about second chances. Talk about fifth chances. Talk about 22nd chances. Talk about forgiveness and love. That is what's personified in this father with his son. I mean, th this son here, he can't believe it. You know, maybe dad is crazy. Maybe, you know, he doesn't understand what's going on. Okay, like I was going to say. Um, oh, did I miss one? All right. The, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. You know, this is what I was about to say to you, Father. Let me just say it. Um, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You know, there's that breakthrough. Talking to his father. Full repentance. I'm sorry for what I've done. I deserve anything that you've given to me. But look at what the father does. The father doesn't punish. The father doesn't shame. The father doesn't humiliate. Look at how the father treats this child of his that has been going down a bad path. Instead of giving shame... It's all forgiven. It's all forgotten. The father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and, calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and celebrate. 
For the son of mine was dead, but is alive again. He was lost and, it is, and is now found, and they be all began to celebrate. Man, talk about a 180 degree difference from what we would expect. If you were writing this, that is not how you would write this. That is not how we would have acted. But we take a look at what is going on here, and we see someone coming back in repentance and asking forgiveness after going down a long line of bad decisions. And we see love, we see forgiveness, we see patience. Again, I said before, this is a parable. So this isn't so much how to, but this is Jesus showing you God's heart, what God thinks about things. And take a look at what then is going on here. We see a child of this father, a child of God, going down a bad path, realizing they are going down a bad path, coming back into the father's presence and asking for complete forgiveness. And in God's eyes, it is forgiven and it is forgotten. And in fact, he celebrates the fact that I get to hear from you. I celebrate the fact that you are saying sorry because now we can get healed and we can get you back on the right path. Instead of following the things that you want, let's follow the healthy things, the good things, the things that will help you to get you on the good path. And that's exactly what happens, just like I said to the kids, whenever you come in here. Whenever you come in here, you come in here with your baggage and your past and your regrets and the things that you would not tell the person you shook hands with earlier that you have done, but God wants to hear from it. And he is waiting for you to say these things so that he can throw his arms around you in forgiveness and forgive you again and again. And a, That is why we're here. That's the point of it. We have great cookies, but I hope you're not here for the cookies. You're here to hear that your God loves you again and again and again, no matter what you have done because of what Jesus did for you. Okay, let's put this now into our lives. And again, like I said last time, you might not be a person that takes notes, but especially if you have a person in your life that is going down a path, I have six, but then I came up with another one, a bonus one, six things for you to maybe write down, to keep in mind, for that person that is struggling right now, for that person that is going down a bad path, maybe it's for you. Maybe you are the one going down a bad path and need help. So let's, do the, let's go down and let's take a look at six seven teachings that we get from this text to show us now what we can do when we go back into our mission fields. Here's the first thing we can do. The most important thing is make sure that your spiritual compass is pointed correctly. You know, whenever we come into God's house here, one of the first things we do is we always confess our sins. We always go and we always talk to God about the things that we have chosen to do. That is our way of getting back on the right path. And then we get to hear again and again that we are absolutely forgiven. Make sure, if you have someone in your life going down the bad path, make sure that your life is pointed correctly. How do you do that? Take a look at Psalm 109, 119, I'm sorry. God's word says, or your lamp, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. You see, it is God's word alone that shows us that we have a Savior that was willing to die for you. It is God's word alone that shows us that we are absolutely and completely forgiven of the things that we have done. It is God's word alone that shows us now that we can reflect that, even though we're sinners. God will use us and reflect that to people in our lives, especially going down bad paths. So the first thing we're going to want to do, make sure that your spiritual compass is pointing correctly so that you now can go and show that to others. Second thing, like we saw in our text, give your friend love. We saw God's attitude for us in this parable. We saw God's attitude in the father to the son. When he saw him, he gave him love. This friend of ours, or if it's you, you know that you live in a world where you are shamed, where you are made to feel bad, they need something different from us. They need us to show them love. Remember, God's love for you is not based on what you have done. It's not based on your scorecard. 
God's love for you is based on Jesus' scorecard, on what he did for you. And the best thing that you can do is show that to someone else, to show them that you still love them even if they've made bad choices. Because how many bad choices have we made? And God still loves us. Third, just like, God, just like the father in the parable, stay at the foot of the driveway and continue to pray. The father in the parable stood at the foot of the driveway and waited, and waited patiently for his son to come back. And he prayed for his son to come back. See, the worst thing we can do, especially at the beginning, if they're going down a bad path, is to cut them out of our lives, to shun them out of our lives. The best thing we can do is stay in contact with this person that's going down and just be there for them. Psalm 139 says this. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. The best thing we can do is stay connected and pray, 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 pray for that person. Whenever we pray, God changes things and God moves things to answer it. If we want God to be active in their lives, we call on him to be active in, our li- in their lives, to pray, pray, pray for them. Let God lead. Let God lead them because God is their God too. Number four, patient and consistent and wait. You notice God took the long view in this. God the Father in this parable, he took the long, patient route on this. He didn't go chasing after him. He didn't go and do things. He let his son go through these situations and he patiently waited for him to come back. So number four, be patient and consistent and wait. Take a look at Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate. Your Lord is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay, but according to our iniquities. As our friend goes down, all we can do is be patient with them and be waiting for them when they come to their senses, praying for them, hoping that God will lead them back. Number five, be careful to fix their pain. You notice that the father didn't chase after him and give him more money. You notice that the father didn't come in and fix his son's problem. Sometimes pain is good. I mean, think about it. If I were to come up to you today and say, you know what, my hips hurt. My hips are, well, because uh, I have a disease. Well, that's one thing. If my hips hurt because I'm now working out and now running, well, that pain is a good thing. I'm actually getting stronger through this pain. And sometimes God will allow pain to happen in our lives and in our friends' lives for our good. So as we're patiently waiting for our friend or our coworker or our, our loved one or even us, God might allow pain to happen in their lives. It's God's job to control that and to lead them. Again, God is their God too. Sixth, the best thing that we can do is do what Jesus does. If you want to know what God thinks, go into Scripture because he will tell you the truth. We know this truth, and this truth we can go and give to others. Sometimes the best thing we can do is patiently wait in love, but tell them the truth. They're going to live in a world that is going to tell them things that they they can keep doing it because it's legal. They can keep doing it because you get to do what you want. They get to keep doing it because they're not hurting anybody. It's our job to tell them God's truth and then let God be God and change their hearts. And here's the the bonus. The bonus is, this as a blessing. If you have a friend in your mission field going down a bad path, look at this as a blessing because you have the ability to possibly change their heart by the way that you act. You have the ability to show them Jesus. You have the ability to show them one who is willing to die and spill his blood for them. You have the ability to make an eternal difference in this person's life. So that's our job. God is going to give us people in our lives that are going down bad paths that are making bad decisions. And how we treat that is a great way and a new opportunity to reflect Jesus and to be a blessing to that person. Maybe exactly the person that God put in their mission field to help them. So with that, we're going to close in prayer, but I want you to think of that one person in your life that is going down a bad path. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's a friend of yours. And let's go and now let's talk to our Lord about it in prayer as we close our service, as we close our sermon. Lord Jesus, 
We are so grateful for the encouragement that we find only in your cross. You know what it is like to hurt, and you know what it is like to have hearts that hurt for those that you love. You put yourself on the cross to give us strength, to give us encouragement, to pay for all of our misdeeds, to pay for all the times that we follow the wrong path, but also to assure us that God never stops loving us or ever stops working for us. Thank you, Lord, and help us to be patient and kind as we reach out in love to those who are not making good choices. Help us to be patient just as you are with us. And through our example, through the opportunities you present them, that you present to us, help us to present your cross and your love and your gospel to give encouragement and strength to those who really need it in their walk of faith. It's in your name we pray, O Lord.